Thank you, Dr. Emily Horowitz, for arranging this talk. Most importantly, I thank God for returning my freedom and proving my innocence in late 2009 after over 18 years in New York State maximum security prisons as an innocent man. This rudest awakening began on August 6, 1991, when arrested in front of my mother's residence where I lived with my parents and four siblings, detectives placed a gun to my head, yanked me into a police car, and sent me to an undisclosed precinct. My mother was crying inconsolably as I was taken away from my Washington Heights neighborhood in Upper Manhattan, New York City. At a Greenwich Village nightclub, I should say uh, precinct, I was charged with murder. Hours would pass and I would learn about an incident that began in a Greenwich Village area stemming from an altercation at a nightclub in which a 16-year-old who had absconded from a work release program had been punched. This 16-year-old, who wasn't even supposed to be outside and was past his curfew in violation of the law, sought retaliation. Inside the nightclub, he told several of his West 90s neighborhood friends from Upper Manhattan who had punched him. About an hour or so later, according to documented evidence, the individuals emerged from the party and on the corner of 13th and University Place, at about 3 a.m. in the morning, a melee ensued in which an estimated 60 to 70 Latinos were attacking an estimated 30 blacks. On the corner, a jeep suddenly drove up and hindered escape. The individual who was being focused on was Raymond Blount, who came with three friends of his from his Queens neighborhood. Out of the melee that ensued in which bottles were broken, fists flew, and witnesses were attacked, Raymond Blount was shot dead. Police descended on the neighborhood, on the area. They arrested, or I should say, gathered his teenage friends who had come with him from his Queens neighborhood, along with four other teenage witnesses. They were brought to the 6th Precinct in Lower Manhattan, where they were interrogated, hungry, tired, traumatized, and fatigued after hours of interrogation. They were brought to an uptown Manhattan precinct to look at pictures where a 17-year-old young lady in an illegal identification procedure picked my picture as someone who resembled the perpetrator. This came after she picked out other alleged suspects. The identification procedure under which these witnesses were exposed was illegal because the witnesses had been allowed to share my picture after the 17-year-old young lady picked it out. This was illegal and it contaminated the foundation upon which my identification stood and which today is the leading cause of wrongful convictions by over 76% in terms of mistaken eyewitness identification. But I didn't know any of this. I didn't know that also upon the three friends of the deceased who were also separately exposed to a photo identification procedure in which my picture was also shared, they had picked out the 16-year-old who was actually involved and who sought retaliation from having been punched. They picked him, but they said and stressed that I upon seeing me in a lineup in which I stood, in which I sat, that I was not the person who shot their friend. At the time, I stood 6'2 and weighed about 220 pounds versus the, the descriptions that police received of the suspect being 5'10, 165 pounds. But in me being made to sit, my height and weight were hidden 
from the smoked glass mirrors that I found myself before. But even though three friends deceased had steadfast said that I was not the person, these teenage witnesses exposed to the contaminated identification procedure said that I did look like the person. But the 16-year-old, however, it is important to note, who knew who actually committed the crime, told the police and prosecutor just that. On August 5th, he had told police and prosecutor in a videotaped interrogation who the perpetrator was, that he could be found in the West 90s neighborhood, who some of the cohorts from this West 90s neighborhood was, and that he was a neighborhood drug dealer by the name of Wu Lu. Police and prosecutor, as hours passed, learned my nickname, my street name as totally different, my neighborhood in Upper Manhattan, totally different. I told the police and prosecutor my whereabouts, telling them that under no circumstances on the night of August 3rd and 4th was I involved in any violence whatsoever. In fact, I emphasized, it was the happiest day of my life, for I had just enrolled in the medical profession, having taken a college placement test that very day. Why would I be involved in any nonsense or anything as senseless as murder? But I was not believed. And with a snap of briefcases, I was sent to arraignment at the Manhattan Tombs, the Manhattan House of Detention Center, where the crowded, smelly conditions, reeking of urine, vomit, and defecation, made me question, why was I there? Pleading not guilty at my arraignment, I was sent to Rikers Island, Rikers Island in Elmhurst, Queens, in 1991, a place that was still simmering from a riot that had just taken place the year before. It was a place that the New York Times dubbed a bloody struggle for control. That was because in 1991, I would later learn an estimated over 200, 2,500, I should say, Violent incidents were existing in Rikers Island, with inmates cutting and stabbing each other over the phones, with brutality against each other. Police officers that I personally witnessed, correction officers beating down inmates, making them look like the elephant man. I tried to remain patient. My life at 22 had taken a rude detour a place that I never expected in my life to venture to. And I believed that if I, if I remained patient, that the truth would prevail. I had been physically attacked in Rikers Island myself several times. And I believed that if I stood fast on the truth and exercised my rights as a United States citizen, that I would go home, that the truth would prevail. Up until 22, while at Rikers Island, my life had been a spectrum of happiness, a rainbow of promise smiling in my life as I sought to atone for my past mistakes and make something of my life in the future by entering college. My childhood had been quite happy living close-knit with my parents in Upper Manhattan, Washington Heights, the building where I was arrested from at gunpoint. I would enter Inwood Park in Upper Manhattan, near the cloisters, that medieval outpost, and I would play Run, Catch, and Kiss in the park in crayon-colored forests, where my aspirations at that point to become a geologist had begun under a hot sun whose molten egg yolk fried before us. I casted my cares, believing that despite my discouragement at not being able to find steady or employment beyond my, pa my parking garage job, that the medical profession would land me in a position where I would finally be able to 
earn a living and support my future family. But in prison, grief is a colorless prism through which the colors of our emotions are broken down and bleached. I'm talking about the color red, apart from the bloodshed that I saw. Put that aside. Red as in the passion and desire that a human being needs in life. I'm talking about the sunshine, joy and happiness of both orange and yellow. The connection of green to nature and healing. The tranquility and calmness of blue and purple. The color of nobility, luxury and ambition. All of this was being taken away from me. More so when I went to trial. At trial, I took the stand, gave my whereabouts as I had in the police precinct. My three alibi witnesses came forward at my trial as well as they did in the precinct and said, under no circumstances were we involved in any violence. No physical and forensic evidence linked me to this crime. The three friends of the deceased who were standing right next to the victim when he was shot said, Fernando Bermudez is not the man who shot our best friends. But, unknown to me, the procedure would grow very complicated in that the teenage witnesses had got up one by one and said, I either looked like the person or was the person in addition to the state star witness saying that I was a person who I totally was not. I was not Wulu, yet he insisted that I was. That I was that neighborhood drug dealer from his neighborhood. At the time, all I can verify was where I actually lived. And my own street name, which the police and prosecutor knew. But they chose to ignore this. I didn't know that against this backdrop, the teenage witnesses had actually cut a deal with the prosecutor in which their own criminal history was dismissed with pending charges unrelated to this case that they had on the eve of my trial if they testified. This too occurred with the state star witness who will now, as a result of perjuring himself, of lying under oath, would be allowed not only to have left the police station on August 5th after 27 hours of interrogation but would not be charged as an accomplice to murder. So here I am against this formidable opposition and I was hindered from the start. Yet I believe that the truth would nevertheless prevail from Rikers Island and unfortunately an investigation that had begun as a result of the key leads being adduced at trial in which a pro bono private investigator, formerly decorated homicide detective, had begun investigating the West 90s with, was not able to stop the proceedings from me being sentenced. This despite the fact that he found this individual named Wu Lu existed. He found witnesses on that nightclub stating that I was not there, that they've never seen me or knew me from the neighborhood, and that Wu Lu was in fact in the nightclub. But none of this was enough. And on September 22nd, 1992, after having been found guilty from an 11 day trial on February 1992, I was sentenced with a resounding pound of the gavel to 23 years to life in New York State maximum security prison. There began my odyssey, my baptism of fire on a, on a level that I never thought I would survive. I was stripped of my civilian clothes. My head was shaven. I was spread with lice liquid and doused with water so cold that it was as if an ice pitcher was being poured over my head. Standing humiliated, naked, until being told to put my clothes on, my new clothes were stamped with a number, 
92-83-25. Turn around for the camera. As I stood to my right, as I stood forward, my pictures were taken, and now I was in official custody of the New York State Department of Corrections, where old problems from Rikers Island continued in New York State maximum security prisons. The residual effect driving me full force into the reality that this also was a horrible place. As men came up with what was called buck fifties or stitches from here to there and who sought revenge for what happened on Rikers. This was the shirt I received in 1992. This shirt became the shirt that I would wear for over 17 years in New York State maximum security prisons. Over 18 when you include Rikers. This shirt was the shirt I wore to prison visits. It became the shirt of my human indignity as I sought to prove my innocence. I landed in my next real serious maximum security prison, Elmira Correctional, whose Civil War beginnings now housed a level of urban violence where people continued cutting and stabbing each other, where the noise as soon as I arrived was unbearable, so unbearable that I couldn't even hear myself think. For the first time in my life, being depressed six hours from my family in New York City who had trouble visiting me, lonely from affection, deprived of food, humiliated after each visit in which I was strip searched, quickly replacing the joy I felt with my family, replaced instead with having to show my butt to a correctional officer, I considered killing myself. I was just so depressed because 23 years to life seemed like a marathon that I could not finish. But I decided instead that I needed to write and become proactive. I needed to write to get a pro bono attorney because by now I had no more money to afford an attorney. And I continued writing letters. My father, by now drinking, to find an answer in an empty bottle with an empty promise, nevertheless went on a crusade to find the truth. And he found an attorney who was willing to leave her Westchester estate and start working pro bono on my behalf. Her name was Mary Ann DeBarry. She had been a nun for many years, and upon seeing the social injustice in society, had earned a law degree in her late 40s. Soaking wet at about 100 pounds, with the energy of a hummingbird and the voice of a teeny bopper, she had the courage of a Joan of Arc. She went into the housing projects of Queens, Manhattan, the Lower East Side, and found these teenage witnesses yearning to tell the truth, whose conscience was not letting them sleep. In sworn affidavits, by 1993 and 94, they attested to the reasons why they lied, were coerced, threatened, and pressured into identifying me. The state star witness himself had admitted that he purposely lied against me because the police and prosecutor were showing him my picture, which was already had been misidentified by the 17-year-old girl. And when he saw an opportunity to get himself out of the problem, he did, not to mention accessory to murder charges after 27 hours of custodial interrogation. And for me, it felt like the dawning of a new day. As we entered Manhattan State Supreme Court under the same judge who sentenced me, Justice John Bradley. But the judge didn't want to hear any of this. He refused to test the evidence in an evidentiary hearing, thereby denying my due process rights against the Constitution of the United States as well as New York State. He laughed at her essentially. And year after year, 
this would happen. What was I going to do next? I was growing very depressed. Under the conditions that I found myself in, I knew that I had to continue writing, but I had to continue dealing with living in a six by nine foot cell, so small, trying to organize my mental stability in a cramped quarter where people were making noise next to me, defecating next to me, cutting and stabbing each other. And I enrolled in college because education became the strongest driving force at one point to help me keep my mind positively occupied. But there was another driving force that was starting to add color despite the colorless prism of my wrongful conviction, despite the emotions of joy being removed, of satisfaction being removed, of hope being removed, and faith being tested. And the driving force in this colorless prism was love. Love, that element of martyrdom, Love, the strength of patriots. Love, what makes a person give up their organ for someone else to live. Love was driving this attorney to continue fighting for me. Love was driving my parents to now, even though I lost all my appeals at the state level, to take a loan and to help pay for a new attorney. When by 2000, the only option I had left was to enter federal court and file a writ of habeas corpus attacking the constitutionality of my state court conviction. My parents could not afford paying $15,000 and they took a loan. Fortunately, having studied business for a few years and having earned a degree in business while in prison, I applied the basic fundamental principles of business management to my life in prison. Not only was I working in the prison kitchen for a mere 38 cents an hour, cleaning titanic kettles, cleaning dirty grates of food, mopping floors, doing computer work, so that I could save that money and send it home to my family, but also I got the idea that if I bought clothing wholesale, I could retail it in prison. I would buy clothing ranging from sweatpants, sweat hoods, sweatshirts, dress shirts, underwear, socks, as low as a few dollars, say five dollars, at times reselling them for fifteen to twenty dollars. I didn't receive physical cash, however. I received stamps and cigarettes, which I would send home in lump sum and get it liquidated at the corner bodega. This helped pay the remaining amount of money that I needed for my attorney. I felt that now that I was a married man with a child and another child on the way, and now that I had won my wife's heart, the question was, how was I going to treasure it? And I sought to continue sending her money because my wife, Crystal Bermudez, was experiencing extreme poverty under the conditions that she found herself. Basically a single mother. And I sent her money uh, in the form of stamps and cigarettes and so forth and she exchanged that so she could prevent from being homeless at times. To pay the phone bill which was exorbitant at ten dollars per call for every thirty minutes. That was the exploitation going on within the prison industrial complex that I find myself in. Where the 13th Amendment had a clause that justified cheap labor and allowed men to work for a pittance, the products they made being sold at a markup and good profit. But by 2002, my efforts paid off. My case was reopened for the first time. I entered federal court. This judge, 
a federal judge, unlike the state court judge, ordered all the witnesses to come forward. And in federal court in Lower Manhattan, Pearl Street, the witnesses one by one testified to the reasons why they sent me to prison as an innocent man. Unfortunately, however, by 2004, the judge rejected my appeal. He did, however, grant the fact that the witnesses had been exposed to an illegal identification procedure which contaminated the identification. But he stopped short of overturning the conviction, turning back to that cold black and white transcript of what the witnesses said at trial rather than what they said before him. I was devastated, needing immediate psychological counseling while living in that small cell. Noises resounding, depression overtaking me again. I think that Jack London's white fang captures the level of existence at this point as to how I and many others felt in prison. Jack London wrote, Night falls, and with its falling, a faint far cry arises on the still air. A cry that seems to be a combination of sad fierceness and hungry eagerness. The eagerness that I had was for my freedom being denied. But instead of giving up, I exercised my faith. Faith became the spiritual masseuse which relaxed my fears when I was full of consternation, not knowing what to do next. I joined the choir at church, despite what I saw in my case, despite what seemed like insurmountable odds, and I sang praises to God with a choir. By 2005, my letter writing campaign continued to pay off. Court TV aired my story. It became a national situation now, with people across the country writing, even sending donations to my wife to help her. What can we do, was the main question. People gathered and rallied in front of the Manhattan District Attorney's Office with picket signs and Free Fernando Bermudez slogans. By 2006, MSNBC got involved, aired it nationally as well. Then the New York Times stamped the, the case front page. This created a level of unknown nervousness in the district attorney's office. Unknown to myself or any of my defense team, they had begun what they should have began in 1991, an investigation. What they were trying to do was substantiate the key leads that their star witness had told them. Instead, these leads already lies by our verification, backfired and started proving my innocence even more. By 2007, I obtained a new team of pro bono attorneys. Another newly minted attorney from Seton Hall Law School said on a prison visit at Sing Sing, Fernando, we can get you back to state court despite you having lost 10 appeals. I said, how? How can you do it? Well, I can't do it alone, she emphasized. I'm going to get you attorneys from across the country. And she got attorneys from Washington, D.C., Park Avenue law firms, New Jersey law firms, the Innocence Project, who wrote an amicus brief, Centurion Ministries from Pinston, New Jersey, who also wrote an amicus brief. The law firm of Davis Polk, 450 Lexington. Armed with this evidence, we entered state court, this time before a new judge. A new judge who was incensed over the idea that the state wanted to investigate after so long. But he gave them that. He gave them a few months to investigate, 
under which the ensuing months and the cross-countrywide investigation, they found more evidence that proved my innocence. Now, disclosed at trial, the judge was even more incensed because the state, for the first time, had admitted that a state star witness had committed perjury. This in itself was a breakthrough. And in late 2009, I entered court, brought from Sing Sing Correctional Facility where I was completing my bachelor's degree in behavioral science under a scholarship. I left Sing Sing and went to Rikers Island where I was shackled and handcuffed with men once again joining a bus. And I entered that courtroom. And the judge, this time, in a procedure with 11 witnesses in my favor, at the 11th hour, after an 11 day trial, hushed the courtroom in rapt attention. The courtroom was packed. Reporters were scribbling furiously, snapping pictures. Overhead, I looked at the judge perched at his bench, and it said, in one of the last few remaining courtrooms in America, in God we trust. And I did trust in God. That is because before I entered that courtroom, ladies and gentlemen, I was offered a plea bargain from the district attorney's office, in essence, that if I pled guilty to manslaughter rather than second degree homicide for which I was convicted, I would be released. Yet, with the same scarlet letter of murder, I said, no, I'm not going to lie to my parents. I'm not going to lie to my wife. I'm not going to lie to my children, who by now number three. No. I rejected that bargain, and I went forward. And it was the best decision as that courtroom settled, because in late, in late November 2009, the judge declared me actually innocent. And there was a punctuating sigh of relief in that courtroom as I was overjoyed, crying in my attorney's bosom, hugging my defense team of powerhouse attorneys. An over $800,000 defense, which I couldn't afford, given to me for this moment, resulting in victory. The judge did not stop there. He ruled that the prosecutor knew and should have known that it was relying on perjured testimony. That for the first time, the state had admitted it start when it had committed perjury. In a big, I told you so. That three, that the witnesses were exposed to an illegal identification procedure, which should not have occurred, all wrapped up into an actual innocence claim which made New York State legal history because it received the same recognition as a DNA-based exoneration. That's how overwhelming the evidence was in my favor. Shortly thereafter, I was released into the loving arms of my family. Outside the courtroom, there had been a jubilee with my supporters and the crush of reporters waving Free Fernando Bermuda shirts, no longer needed because it had happened. I quickly went to my home now in Connecticut, and the prison doors fresh in my mind having opened because I had exited Sing Sing Correctional Facility, formerly a deaf house, Hollywood style. Those doors for the first time in decades had opened and I was allowed to walk through the front and I was just adjusting in that when I went out, I had discarded most of my property and had taken back one of the old sweaters that I had, which was all wrinkled. And when I came out, I told the reporters, please pardon my wrinkled appearance. What counts now is that my problems are ironed out. But were they? Upon eating my first Big Mac, I went back to Washington Heights, 
where the streets were filled with reporters, people chanting in Spanish, Justicia, Libertad, Verdad, Justicia, Verdad, Libertad, Justice, Truth, Freedom. They were shouting. And I had my first home cooked meal. But I couldn't adjust as good as I thought. I started waking up as if being counted as an inmate in prison. I started hyperventilating, paranoid as, stiff, as if still in prison. The colors of a department store would dazzle me, making me dizzy. I realized that I needed to see a psychologist who diagnosed me with post-traumatic stress disorder. The same type of trauma that veterans from wars after seeing horrible things experience. But what helped me keep going was that I had a vision. And my newfound vision after what I experienced was to devote my life to exposing wrongful convictions, to telling the truth about what I experienced and observed while incarcerated. Today, I continue speaking across America to share my story so that what happened to me should not happen to anyone. Because when I got home, the world had changed so much from technology to my own personality. I realized that in those years of absence during which my family suffered so much, I didn't even know my own parents anymore in many ways, and my own parents didn't even know me. They didn't know that their son had changed in ways that now sought to be a responsible person and even at times seclude himself in Connecticut just so he could be a father. Not that I didn't love my parents, but that I had a responsibility which I had to address. What I found was that love had to continue driving me. The love for my children, the love in being able to take them to school every day. The love, even though that when my son cries in my ears with enough decibels to be stronger than a New York City subway system, when he says, Daddy, I love you, that that in itself is enough to deal with my post-traumatic stress disorder on that day. My daughter, when I take her to Taekwondo, seeing her develop, earning her belts. My eldest daughter, despite the trouble she's experienced, having dropped out of college because of the trauma associated with me coming home and her feeling like she wasn't loved, now is all being connected with love. Just yesterday, I celebrated my birthday, and I received a beautiful gift from my eldest daughter, a beautiful silver pen with the name freedom engraved in it. Love is what continues keeping us together. Love is what I urge you to use as the driving force to what continues making your success possible. Today, as you are in St. Francis College, the small college of big dreams, I urge you to continue thinking big. As Maury Povich puts it, birth certificates are one thing, but love is another. I want you to understand that love is the driving force beyond the colorless prism of wrongful conviction that deprives us of life and happiness. Love is what will help you succeed when you feel that you can't out of respect for yourself. That is because love can ennoble or demean you. Love can raise you to the heights and inspire you, but it can also demean you. I am very saddened by the recent passing of Whitney Houston and how she quoted in Oprah, I believe, how Bobby Brown became her addiction. Well, that is one way how love demeaned her and brought her to the downfall of drugs or whatever caused her death. But I want you to know that as St. Francis Assisi said, keep trying to do what is necessary, then what's possible. And suddenly, 
you're doing the impossible. Love will push you in that direction. Love is will continue pushing me until my last breath to speak against wrongful convictions, to prevent what happened to me from happening to anyone else. That is my passion and the driving force beyond the colorless prism of wrongful convictions. Thank you. Well, nothing has happened to the prosecutor to the extent that he is now a uh, defendant in my civil lawsuits against the city and state of New York, and he'll have to answer on the hot seat to that. Uh, the perjurers themselves and the victims, these teenage witnesses, were actually just that, victims, because you know, in their formative teenage years, they were exposed to this vulnerability of being pressured, coerced, and threatened into falsely identifying me. So they are victims in this case, actually. Isn't the culprit really plea bargaining? Well, the actual, well, yes. In that sense, he did at that point to get himself out the problem. And to that extent, he owes a personal uh, responsibility of going against his conscience. Uh, but as a 16-year-old held, held over six, 27 hours in interrogation, you know, those are some of the mitigating circumstances against him. But to society itself, for all of us, for the victim in this case, as well as myself and his family and my family, and society who uh, winds up footing the bill for people who wind up in prison for crimes they did not commit, uh, it is a travesty because the real perpetrator is out there, which the judge ruled in his decision that the state of New York knows and it's up to them to pursue this matter which has not happened yet. The judge also had apologized to me. The only one unrelated to this case, in terms of no one in the past proceeding, proceedings who denied me justice, uh, he apologized on behalf of New York State. And that meant so much to me. And he hoped for me, quote unquote, a much better future. Uh, under what's called best practices in New York, uh, witnesses are not supposed to discuss a photograph and what occurred was that they were in a small room in a table perhaps as long as this sitting opposite each other and they were just given draws of pictures to look through or just look through anybody as they selected pictures jokingly and 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 you know making fun of different people they saw and at times putting together what, what became sort of like a a sinister game of uh, Mr. Potato Head in saying that uh, different people resembled this person and putting them together to try to make a composite sketch of the person, they shared pictures and discussed it. And they're, not supposed to? they're not supposed to because that reinforces the mistaken impression that one witness may have. This is further compounded by the fact that after seeing that, they see me in a lineup. They already saw the picture, now they see it in a lineup, and I'm made to sit down. Moreover, Unlike best practices now, the detective, by his own admission, in addition to not investigating by his own admission, told the witnesses in a legal identification procedure, once my photo was placed in a folder to be selected, tell me who you think is responsible. Police officers are not supposed to do that. At best, they're supposed to say, tell me if you think someone may be responsible in this photo array of six pictures, rather than tell me who is responsible. These are practices that since have now been improved to prevent the greatest problem of uh, wrongful convictions, which is mistaken eyewitness identification, which is, beget, which is what began my problem. What's happening is that there is an increase in lawsuits, but unfortunately prosecutors do, do enjoy what's called the immunity from prosecution from these cases, unless you could show a higher level of malicious intent in violating a person's human rights, which is what my case definitely rests upon, uh, thank goodness. Uh, but, you know, it's a, it's a problem. I mean, one of the more recent cases where they were held accountable was the Luke, Duke Lacrosse case, in which that prosecutor was ousted. That particular person lost his job. But in New York State, you really don't have this. At best, you have a reprimand. It doesn't really do anything. Whereas the, pol the, pro the police are held more accountable. Uh, it's a problem, and this is why I'm going to Albany very soon to meet with some more legislators to try to revamp new laws and improve.
I'm doing what I can in traveling, as well as seeking to abolish the death penalty in Connecticut, where I was incarcerated uh, over 18 years, over 6,700 days, and I am currently seeking compensation under New York State law. Not yet. I've been relying on public speaking uh, to support myself and my family. My wife works less than part-time, and this is how we support ourselves, particularly since I was just completing my bachelor's degree, which I just did this December. <laughs> Straight A's. <laughs> I think you deserve a PhD. Well, thank you. I, I, I've been offered, fortunately, an opportunity to uh, pursue my postgraduate degree at a university to teach there, and uh, I've also been offered uh, two positions in law schools. Uh, which I'm considering as well. Well, the main word is intervention. Oftentimes, people get exonerated or released from prison, proven innocent, not because of the system, but in spite of it, because it takes someone to intervene. Even in the case of, for example, over 289 DNA-based exonerations to date, all those cases, despite DNA being the magic bullet that killed the big bad wolf in that wrongful conviction, still took the intervention of attorneys to get involved to get that evidence tested. But it wasn't because the system itself said, please come. In fact, they sometimes reject it time and time again until by court order, they have to test it. Under federal law, they can rely upon uh, what's called a two-pronged test to test uh, the reliability of a conviction. First, if it is suggestive, under the back identification procedures, which he acknowledged, I passed one test. The second test is that then they have to test if the recantations or the evidence is reliable. And under federal law, he can still rely upon the trial transcript, despite the fact that the witnesses were before him stating the reasons, despite the fact that I was not this Wulu character, that the person had perjured himself. It didn't matter. Under state court, that wasn't, allowed to ha that wasn't supposed to happen. I've gotten angry many times. I mean, in the prison yards, I had to sometimes run to exhaustion. I was so angry because I couldn't sleep at night. I continue running to exhaustion <laughs> at times because my nerves. I, I, I get nervous just sometimes having restless nights of sleep and remembering things that happened that I saw. Uh, but the main thing is not to be bitter and broken and to move forward, ladies and gentlemen, because if I allow unforgiveness, bitterness and resentment to overtake my life, then how would I be productive in helping to save someone else from what happened to me? Well, it's, it's, it's I mean, it's, I'm not gonna say it's a lottery, but it's a very uh, uphill battle to get chosen by an innocence project because it's a very strict screening process. Some innocence projects will only take DNA-based exonerations where science can prove it. The harder cases to crack, such as mine, a non-DNA case, took years of investigation as I told you. Uh, and so those are the harder cases to crack. And you know, New York's Innocence Project is one of the ones that is you know, trying to do what it can, but really limited to DNA-based exonerations, whereas other sprouting wrongful conviction organizations are now starting to investigate, such as the De Jeffrey Deskovic Foundation. I couldn't believe it. I mean, my jaw dropped. And you know, quite frankly, you know, I believed that at that point, if I just told the truth, that I would be free to go. That this was a big mistake, a big misunderstanding, which would be clarified through the disinfected called truth. Uh, but it didn't happen like that. The situation got quite smelly. I was supposed to be appointed a, a public defender, but my parents panicked and believed that I would be railroaded further through a public defender, which turned out to be a mistake because uh, under the gossip of Washington Heights, perhaps in, near the the Hunt's Tomato Paste section of a Seatown supermarket, my parents, who had limitations in English, heard through word of mouth that there was an attorney who they chose uh, because he spoke Spanish. Turns out that he specialized in immigration and divorce, uh, <laughs> which is in part what caused me to be uh, separated from society, as you see. The maximum uh, sentence I could have received was 25 years to life. I got a little less. Uh, however, I did have uh, an arrest record of marijuana which is what landed me in the mugshot books, which is why my story to the youth that I speak to, and anyone at that, uh, really attests to the fact that the perils of getting arrested at any point, ladies and gentlemen, can cause you to land in prison for a crime you did not commit and have unexpected consequences.